Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the fifth lecture in our course. And um, this is a special lecture because here we start the real stuff, in a sense. So we, well, not to say that everything we did was imaginary, but this is what two-thirds of the course is going to be about. It's systems dynamics. And then nonlinear dynamics and chaos, but more or less these are like encompass the same thing. So um, <coughs> before we start this, are there any questions about anything that we did before? Uh, any re anything regarding administrative things as well? I have a few announcements to make, but before that, let's let's hear some questions. Uh, you can ask me if if if, uh, if something comes up, but basically, um, the quizzes everybody passed the quiz, so the first four lectures should have conveyed the proper message. There are interesting results from the survey, and I would ask all of you to really complete it. We'll discuss it next time. Um, I will not discuss any results right now because I don't want to bias some of you. But let me just tell you that I've read your comments and some of the suggestions are going to be incorporated as of now. So um, <coughs> even though I can't say what it is, it's going to be, uh, it's going to happen. All right. <sighs> A quick recap of what we did so far. You know this, but I'm going to repeat it in every, every lecture. Finding solutions, that's what we looked at in the beginning, including, first of all, before we find the solution, we need to have defined the problem. So including defini defining your problem, defining your objectives, and then we looked at the problem-solving cycle. After this, implementing solutions, project management mostly, critical path method, quality control, stuff like that. And now we start with controlling solutions. This is the last part of the course. And the goal, I mean, what does controlling solution mean? The goal of this is we take the system as a given. I'll talk about this later. But we take the system as a given, and we want, we want to understand why it works the way it works. And for this, we're going to analyze it analytically, if we can. And if we can't, simulate it. Very important is modeling, the role of modeling in, uh, in system dynamics. I'll talk at length about modeling, but the purpose, why, why do we need modeling, is, well, we want to not just to explain what the most important parameters for the operation of the system are, but we also want to be able to predict, hopefully, something. And these are not the types of predictions that you read in the news. For example, financial crisis is going to end next year. Point. Full point. Well, full stop. I mean, nobody can make these predictions. Two people make them, but that's another story. Um, the predictions we're going to make are about so-called critical behavior of the system. So when would this system, if we've modeled it correctly, when would it suddenly change its behavior? from stability to instability, or from instability to stability. And um, with modeling, we can also identify what are the key parameters which lead to this sudden change, which lead from a crisis to, uh, to, to stability. So this is what controlling solutions mean. There is a slight uh, confusion sometimes, because people say, well, quality control is some kind of controlling some form of control. So um, what's the difference between implementation? Can't we control the system during implementation? After all, we're building it up, so we should probably know uh, how it's going to work. This is a more or less valid point, but for complex systems, that's difficult to do. If you build complex systems, uh, yes, you can exercise some kind of quality control, but uh, it's very hard, almost impossible, to control the overall operation of the system. So for us, we, we draw the line. Implementing solutions means um, building it block by block your system, and that's all. Controlling solutions mean given your system, so the system is given, how does it behave? 
Okay. <coughs> and as I mentioned, the role of control parameters is very important. <coughs> we need to identify key parameters which lead or do not lead to some expected behavior. So now hopefully you know that solutions and systems sometimes don't behave as we expect them to do. And the reason for most real-world problems is very simple. Complexity is built in into the system. Um, that's just how it is. We cannot get rid of complexity. We cannot kind of discuss it away. Uh, we cannot simplify it. It's there. So we have to learn how to manage it. And in this course so far, we saw four types, yes, four types or four mechanisms for generating complexity. And these are the four mechanisms. First of all, positive feedback loops. Positive feedback loops generate instability, okay? which means it puts limits to your predictability. If the system becomes unstable, um, you basically cannot predict uh, how it's going to behave for all time. And an example is um, the undiscovered rework from the systems dynamics model last week which basically says that, well, after quality control, we get some work that needs to be rechecked, no matter how you call it, undiscovered rework or whatever. This work that needs to be rechecked and redone goes to the work to be done um, stock variable. So basically, uh, it increases it. And there is a positive feedback loop. Uh, more work to be done causes more undiscovered rework due to quality problems, which in turn increases the work to be done. But this was just one, one of the positive feedback loops. There were others. Um, you, you probably remember them. So this is one mechanism, positive feedbacks. Second mechanism are the small changes, or the small either changes or random deviations, however you'd like to look at them. With the US Navy case, these were small changes. They were not that random from the U.S. Navy perspective. They were quite random from the, from the shipbuilder pers shipbuilder's perspective. So these small changes through positive feedbacks get amplified to enormous proportions sometimes. This is another source of complexity. Negative feedback loops are something good. They bring stability, but unfortunately, in most real-life situations, every negative feedback loop is associated with a corresponding positive feedback loop. And <coughs> often we're not aware of the positive feedback loop. So always think um, how your measures affect your organization or your system in ways that you don't normally expect. These are the positive feedback loops um, that you need to try to identify. And last lecture at the end, I couldn't finish it completely. We addressed the most important figures in the self-study. It's the role of concurrency or um, time-boundedness. What this means is even though we can parallelize project phases or we can parallelize activities within, within a project phase, there are still some time boundaries that we need to respect. Some things simply need to be done after other things have finished. It's just how it is. We cannot really start designing a product before we have some form of product concept. So this sequencing, in a sense, um, leads to changes in the downstream, so changes in, the, um <coughs> in subsequent stages to propagate back, to up, back upstream. For instance, if there is a quality problem downstream, this thing may propagate through positive feedbacks again, may propagate all the way up. And in fact, if, you, if you've already seen the so-called bullwhip effect in, um, in the supply chains, you will going to see it in, in the next lectures and try to model it, but um, it, it's exactly what happens there. You have a very small change downstream to the customer, so the demand fluctuates very little, and then this whole these fluctuations, they propagate all the way up to the manufacturer of raw materials, and then they see huge inventory fluctuations there. And um, I'm pretty sure you're going to see this in other courses as well, namely management information systems, if some of you are taking it. 
uh, from a different perspective. Here we try to model it. But this is the idea. Due to this kind of time constraints that we have, changes propagate and get amplified. So these are the sorts of complexity that we saw. Um, now we start with systems dynamics. And what is systems dynamics? System dynamics is the following. We take the system as a given. Somebody gives us the system. We don't try to build it up. There is a difference because next semester there is another course taught by this chair uh, which is called Collective Dynamics of Firms and there we actually build systems. But here the system is given, airport, society, whatever. And we consider the structural view. Remember in the first self-study we had a structural and we had a functional view of the system. We consider the structural view which means what is the system made of? What are its elements? Um, and we focus on its behavior with on the behavior within the system, meaning mostly feedback loops within the system, because these are the most important ones. So system and environment also are given for us, and then we focus on what is the system made of and how do different elements in the system interrelate with each other via not just via direct links but also via positive feedbacks. And here, this, this is taken from uh, the Wikipedia page on systems dynamics. The, the figure is correct. It, it, it's, it's kind of, it's nice also. But I wouldn't recommend reading the, the information on system dynamics from Wikipedia because uh, it seems to be a very special case of what system dynamics is. It seems to be what some guy did in his in his project uh, at work. So this is what I mean. You don't need to read it, but if in case you read it, don't don't read too much into it. Um, just so for now, don't try to understand what all these elements are. So what is this and that? Just try to get an idea of how a systems dynamic uh, system dynamics model looks like. It looks like this. I'll explain this. Uh, in, in during the rest of the lecture, but also uh, also now a little bit. So what are the system's elements? That's very important. Uh, system dynamics, the system's dynamics perspective considers elements as typical elements, or in other words, representative agents, which is what macroeconomics does all the time. So we don't have uh, different individuals, different firms, different countries, different... Um, suppliers, we have the typical individual or the average individual. In fact, um, that's exactly what it is. It's mathematically the average individual. When people have, let's say, a uh, market survey from 1,000 people, then they would average over some, some parameter and then they would say this is what the average person or representative agent wants. And that's an important thing because if you know this, you will know what to expect from a systems dynamics model. You cannot expect that the system dynamics model is going to tell you why your particular company doesn't work the way you want it to work. Okay, it's a representative agent. We'll get back to that later. Yes, so if you have representative or typical agents, normally your system would have just a few elements. A few, of course, is relative. In that sense, few means relative to the uh, other perspective, which is actually considering every individual agent or every individual element as its own entity. And there is this different perspective on, on modeling as well. I'll talk about this. But for now, just remember this. Typical agents, and we don't have a lot of them in the system. And we're interested in the macro dynamics of the whole system. We're not interested in the problems of the typical firm. We're interested, let's say, uh, in the output of the system that the firm is embedded in. For instance, this could be an economy of a country. So we're, not, we're interested in, let's say, the output of the economy, GDP, for instance. But what does it mean we're interested in macrodynamics? It means two things. First, we want to understand when you apply an input to your system, what is the output that you get back? Okay, and for this, we need to understand what is what are the key control parameters. Yes, yeah, so the relevant parameters. 
So we don't want to just look at the system as a black box, which is fed something and then we get something uh, on the outside. We want to understand how this input is transformed to an output. This is also important. And why do we want to do this? Well, not only would we understand how the system works, but we also understand how different, uh, how different elements interrelate among each other, which is going to help us to make predictions. All right. <coughs> this was the systems, dyna the systems dynamics perspective. Now let's look at that picture. Um, I, I hope you can see it on your slides. So here we have, actually I cannot see it there, I have to look here. Um, yes, yeah, so here we have product adoption, a model for product adoption. It's not important to understand the details, I'm just going to give you a flavor. The details are going to come later on. We have product adoption, we have potential adopters, we have actual adopters who've already adopted the product. We have new adopters, they, and we have some kind of probabilities for an adopter, for a potential adopter becoming a non-adopter, uh, becoming an adopter, and we have feedback cycles. This is a word of mouth effect saturation. We'll understand all these components later on. I'm not going to focus too much on them. But an example for a systems dynamics model, it's actually, this is taken from a textbook, economics textbook. So all the standard economic texts use systems dynamics models. So this is the economy of a country, all right? And uh, in fact, this is the starting point for economics, I would say. I mean this equation here. But anyway, so what are uh, the constituent elements in our country? Well, people said we have firms, typical firms, of course, not individual firms. We have the firms, we have the households, and we have the government. And all the other things that you can think of, for example, the geographical location of the country, you may think that this influences the economy, and that's true. Uh, you may think that um, the financial situation in your neighbors influences uh, your own economy, and that's probably true. You can think of many things which are not in these three simple boxes. What you do in this case, you simply take all these other things and you put them in, uh, in something which here is called overseas. That simply, and this is outside of your system, right? It simply means you don't care about them. Why, why don't you care? Well, we're going to see later on. But in short, you don't care because your model is going to become so complicated, so complex, that then you're not going to be able to tell what is the influence of every individual parameter. If you have thousands of parameters, you can reproduce any result you want. But then which is the parameter which produced this result? You can't say because you have so many interdependencies that it's just impossible to account for. So here we have the firms. Firms pay taxes, get subsidized from the government, especially with the subsidized part. I think you all know that, um, especially if these are banks. So they get subsidized. Uh, households, they offer their work. Uh, for, for the firms, they get income, but they also consume their products. Uh, so they give some money back to the firms. And they also pay taxes to the government. And <coughs> what, what are we interested in? We're not interested in the well-being of the households or the firms. We're interested in the systems. Be on, on, uh, we're interested in a macro um, parameter of the system. And in this case, that's a GDP or the output, the total amount of goods and services, goods and services, and you know that this is simply the sum of consumption plus investment from plus government expenditure uh, and net, uh, net exports. And this is the basic equation. So this is a systems dynamics model. We already know this, probably most of you already know this. So in that sense, we're not going to learn something incredibly new with this kind of modeling things that we're going to do. Which reminds me that now the self-studies are going to be completely different from what they used to be uh, up to now. Up to now we had discussions and we had uh, kind of a hand-waving, but now we're going to have models. It's getting a bit technical. That reminds me of uh, some people want more 
technical things. So it's going to be like this. Uh, the self studies are going to be a lot of modeling. And um, yeah, there is still not the right model, but you'll see that. So this is the systems dynamics per perspective. There is a different perspective, which I just hinted uh, a couple of slides before, and that is the so-called complex systems perspective. What is a complex system? I mean, that's there is no a single definition, but in general, every time you have a system which consists of very many elements, incredibly many elements, and they're so interconnected that you also have very many interconnections, then you can call this a complex system because uh, it's very hard actually to analyze all the interdependencies that happen um, within that system. So many connections, so many elements. As an example, the brain comprises of huge amount of neurons and interconnections between these neurons. And when you have so many elements, it's difficult to predict what the brain would produce as macro properties of the system. It's difficult to predict by studying how two neurons interact or five neurons interact, even if you know how they do, which people do, of course, it's difficult to predict why consciousness, for example, emerges when you combine so many of them, right? And that's why, um, in general, of course, that's not a very technical and correct definition. There is no correct definition what a complex system is. Um, if you have many elements with many connections, that's a complex system. Or well, it's a candidate, let me put it this way. There are other examples. Ants. Ants are probably the prototypical example of a complex system. Why? Because with ants, there is no centralized decision making. There is no, uh, yeah, the queen, but the queen doesn't actually make decisions, it just breeds. So, uh, yeah. But there is no centralized policy or decision making as to how to search for food, for example, or how to search for a new home. The ant self organized entirely via local interactions. So, an ant would probably communicate with just a few of it of, of, of the ants in, in its vicinity via use of pheromones and stuff like that. And I would like to show you <coughs> a simulation of ants just to give you a flavor what this whole self-organization uh, self-organization means. So unfortunately now it's completed. So uh, yeah there is there is a in your notes I believe, yes, in your notes you have the link to that simulation. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of slow. Uh, so what you see here, well, maybe I'll take the chance, uh, take the time to explain what you see. What you see here is ants, the blue things are ants, they start from the middle. And here with red, you see food. Okay, so ants, these guys, they need to search for the food. And a yellow ant, is an ant which has found food and tries to get back to the nest or, or leave some trail so that other ants can, can detect what it's found. Uh, but yeah, so this is a very simple model. Ants can only move, I don't remember the, the details, but they can only move randomly. They don't remember where the home was, so they can't get to it. They just have a very limited memory of what they did. And then if we wait long enough, you're going to see that the ants, and, and basically there are a lot, a lot more ants here in, in, the, in, in, in their nest. They don't all come out at the same time, obviously. So what you see is, if, if wait long enough, uh, see, more and more ants find food. Unfortunately, there is no centralized uh, place where they can call and say, well, we have found food, tell everybody else. Uh, they just leave local trails, like local pheromones, so that if another ant finds it, then it knows, okay, there is food nearby. And what you would see is, amazingly, the ants will find, eventually, the most, the most efficient way of going here, getting the food from the top and getting the food from the bottom. And if you remember what we saw, there was this kind of uh, a line, and I hope we can see that now. Um, First, we're going to see, yeah, well, every time it's different, obviously, because uh, it's random. But, yeah, they will have to find it eventually. And, f 
yeah, if you remember, we saw, so we, you can already see this kind of uh, path which emerges here. So all these ants self-organized into creating a stable path. This is entirely via local interactions. And then eventually this path would also go to the, to the top. So we're not going to wait for that. But this is the other perspective, the complex systems perspective. And this is, in fact, what the research of the chair is about. It's the complex systems perspective, not the system dynamics. But both are valid, of course. All right. <coughs> and then, of course, this perspective, it focuses on how did these ants self-organized via local interactions into a system which exhibits, let's say, the most efficient uh, path finding for food. And the focus is on, uh, on the, this link between the micro interactions and the macro behavior. That's the focus of, of, that, um, of that perspective. But again, we're, we want to understand how the system works. You know, the question is entirely the same. How does the system work? And we just go from here. We study these different interactions. We go to here. We try to explain um, what the important parameters are. And th so this is what the actually the research is about in the chair. But we stick with system dynamics. And, and in fact, this perspective is taught next semester in collective dynamics of firms, where we try to explain how uh, be the behavior of a lot of firms emerges from individual interactions between firms and competitors. Yes? Systems dynamics. So the question is, what is the difference, basically? Remember, in systems dynamics, we look from the top. We look from. We take the bird's eyes perspective, and we look on the system on a given. The system is given for us. We look at it. Uh, from a very coarse grain perspective. We don't care about individual ants. We care about the average ant. What would the average ant do? And then we can only embed this average ant um, in a system which doesn't have other ants, right? Then it wouldn't be the average one. So we can only embed the average ant, let's say, into a system which has a government there. Although I would be very curious what that system might be. but. That, yeah, that's the difference. In the complex systems perspective, it's just a name, complex systems perspective. I call it bottom-up perspective okay. because we start from the yeah, bottom. Yeah. So we, we start, we study, we, we don't define what the system is in this bottom-up ap uh, approach. We, we build it entirely by modeling how this guy communicates and interacts with this guy. And then we just have thousands of these guys, we let them interact and we see what happens. Basically, that's what it is. In the system dynamics, we, we don't care about individual interactions. We care about uh, the, the coarse-grained elements. And it's top-down, right? Because you, you take the system as a, as a given, and um <coughs> you, start, you start drilling down, in a sense. All right. So before we go into the formal modeling, let's introduce a few easy notations. Uh, we have links, so each element is linked to another element. That's very simple. Element A causes an effect on element B. It's a unidirectional effect, obviously, because B doesn't influence A back. There is the feedback. A influences B, B influ influences A. And there is an indirect uh, influence or indir indirect cause. That's, that is A influences B, B influences C, and then indirectly, although C may not know it, A influences C as well. So these are the links, or the, the con how we model the connections. But of course, they, mu they must have, not might have, but they must have polarities. So each link must be positive or negative. If X, in that case it's X, if X causes a positive change in Y, meaning every time X increases, Y increases as well, we have a positive link polarity, vice versa, uh, negative link polarity. And we can write this 
in this mathematical form. So y and x are linked with some nonlinear function f. And f has a control parameter. This is, these are the parameters we're interested in, in fact. By changing this parameter, we change how the x and y are linked, and we completely change the system behavior. So for example, in a supply chain, the control parameter may be, if you define it like this, it may be um, the average delay that you have in, in two sequences of, of, uh, on your production line. But it's entirely up to you how you define it. Um, right, so if you have a nonlinear function f which links x and y, then obviously the rate of change of y, so the increase in y caused by an increase in x is given by the first derivative of the function. If that derivative is positive, then we have then we have uh, positive link polarity. If it's negative, we have a negative link polarity. That's very simple. Now, an important thing is causality. Most of you n have, at some point of your lives, some of you all the time, you have encountered mathematical equations. Uh, but what at least what I didn't do before I, uh, I looked into this slide, I wasn't reading the equation from right to left, at least not consciously. What does it mean? Well, imagine we have... Um, yeah, so what, what this means is that the thing on the right actually is the, is the cause, and this right here. So the thing on the right is the cause, and it has an effect on your, th on your thing on the left. So the causality goes from right to left in a mathematical equation. For example, here we have the rate of change of x with time. Imagine we're interested in this rate of change of x. Uh, what is it caused by? Well, it may be caused by a deterministic force, f, x squared, for instance, plus a stochastic influence. All right? It's very simple, but... Um, this is how causality flows in mathematical equations. And an example here is the second law of motion, uh, the Newton's second law of motion. We have the force is equal to m times a, something which everybody knows. Uh, for instance, if we take the friction force uh, and we substitute it here, right? Uh, this is the acceleration, of course, and the acceleration is the rate of change of speed. So the rate of change of speed, or the acceleration, is equal to f divided by m. If you take the friction force, you get this thing divided by m. m cancels out, and you just get minus gamma times v, where gamma is the friction coefficient. And here you see cause and, and effect. The speed has, a, has an effect on the acceleration. And there is a, this kind of feedback between the two, right? Or in this case, it's a balancing feedback because there is a minus here. And most people don't look in equations in terms of feedback loops, but it's exactly what it is. If we increase v here, the acceleration decreases, and vice versa. So the system is driven towards a stable state, and without even solving it, you can say that the system is driven towards a stable state. Yes? Yes, that's only true for differential equations. That is true. All right, so without even solving it, we can say there is a stable state. There is a balancing state because we have a negative feedback loop. And if you solve it, uh, you see that actually it's zero. So this thing eventually dies down. All right. Um, why was it important? Well, not important, but I mentioned that there is a nonlinear relationship between x and y, between two elements in your system. Well, that's important because if you look in this figure, um, you have the cause, the right-hand side, and you have the effect. So sometimes and often, you 
drive some input into your system and you don't get any effect. You don't get, you don't get any result. But that's not because the two things are not related. So sometimes when you study, you don't get anything out of it. When you study more, you don't get anything out of it. But eventually, right, you may, you, you may be here. This is a very unfortunate nonlinear relationship, especially if you want an effect. But eventually, at this point of time, something happens and you have a sudden shift and you have a huge effect, right? Kind of a threshold behavior. Your quiz is an example of this. If you get less than 50%, there is a fail, right? And suddenly, you get slightly more than 50% and there's a huge change, it's a pass, right? So that's, um, that's important to know because this may also be stability and suddenly we have a crisis. So what, what is the control parameter? What is the cost? This is what we want to identify. And this is the point, most importantly, that we want to identify, the, the point when the critical behavior emerges. The system suddenly changes uh, its qualitative state. And for this, the mathematical terms are phase transitions and bifurcations. You don't need to know what they mean right now. They're all going to be, to be introduced. Okay. <coughs> Another important thing, which I would really like to stress out, especially given my opinion that it's violated blindly in, in real life, in popular media and, and even some kind of academics, violate this. Correlation does not imply causality. Probably from some economics courses you know that already. Especially if you take courses in development economics. Uh, they, are this, they try to make this point very clear. What does it mean? If two variables are correlated, for instance here, we have, and that's, uh, that, that, that's actually an, an empirical fact. I don't know which country and which time, but I remember that this, uh, this was an empirical fact. Ice cream sales are positively correlated with murder rate. Okay? So when ice cream sales increase, murder rate also increases. So does this mean that, that people who buy ice cream become murderers? Or does it mean that when you commit a murder, you feel like eating an ice cream? And then you go and buy an ice cream. Obviously, in this very simple case, it's ridiculous, right? You would say, no, there must be something else going on. There must be a third variable or third factor which influences these two at the same time. And so it happens, it's the average temperature, right? When, when it's hot, you tend to eat more ice, more ice cream. And apparently, something that I don't understand quite a lot, uh, when it's hot, you also tend to get nervous, I guess. Uh, right, but this is the correct way how you model these things. And I said it's violated blindly, maybe, yes? So the conclusion is the average temperature should be the fourth force. Yes. One causing an ice cream sales and one causing murder rate, and eventually it happens at the same time. But not the result. Uh, I, I didn't understand that. The average temperature? Oh yes, yes, yes. That's true. So there is no proof that uh, that. Yeah, you're right. Average temperature may influence ice cream sales, and something else may influence murder rate at the same time. That's true. Indeed. But why why is it violated? Well, I've noticed that a lot of think about it especially if you think in the, in the field of development economics. You see a country with a high GPA is likely to have very educated people. So the two things are correlated. So what is it? Is it the fact that the country invests in education and gets back educated people, which in turn increases GDP? Is that the causation, which means that the policy should be invest in education? you would get higher GDP. Or is it the other way around? Is it that countries which were rich in the first place, they were able to invest in education? Or is it that the third factor influences GDP and, uh, and uh, education at the same time? Or maybe fourth factor influences the education? So 
you see, depending on how you look at the causality, different policies may emerge. And sometimes, when it comes to sensitive topics like, let's say, immigration, people tend quickly to jump into making the causal link given just correlation. And if you somehow try to look for this in newspapers or in media, uh, even experts, you would quickly see that people, without justifying why, they make the causal link. But please be aware that causality, the uh, correlation does not imply causality. You really need to work hard to prove causality. And there is no accepted way how to prove causality, but that's a different topic. All right. <coughs> yes. Exactly. The common thing. <sighs> what is the common thing? Um, I'm not sure you can you can def y you you can define a question like this. Well, because it's very tempting to think that they're the same. Okay. It's very tempting to do this. But in, in our models, we need to... When, when I a lot of times, I would say. But when you create a model, if you're not aware that correlation is different from causality, then you, you can create the wrong model. Okay. You can think that you can create a model which, which is like that, right? Which would be completely wrong. You can reproduce, probably, you can reproduce whatever behavior you want with this model, but it would be wrong. Yes? Yes, that, that is true. The way you, prove, you try to prove causality is you basically try to isolate, let's say you try to isolate these things and then you try to vary the one that you think uh, is the cause and you see if, if you get some effect. Another way is to look in, into time, into how um, the things, the two factors are related in time. If one always comes before the second one, the well, then it's likely that it may be the cause. But often uh, we don't have this strict uh, and convenient uh, time ordering of events or of factors. Yes, but this is, this is in general how you, how you go about causality, proving causality. You try to isolate everything and you vary the cause, what you think is the cause, and see if you get an effect. But then again, keep in mind this. Okay? All right. You already saw this slide. Um, <coughs> in general, what, uh, what, this, what this slide tells you is that X and Y may be related by some function uh, F, nonlinear function F, but a completely different nonlinear function y, uh, g, in this case, may link y and x. And see here we have a, this kind of a balancing, well, it's not yet a balancing feedback. Let me just finish with this slide. If the positive feedback is stronger than the, uh, sorry, it's not a feedback, but if the dispolarity of that link is stronger than the negative one here, then you have a positive feedback. Right, because the net difference is positive. Otherwise, you have a negative feedback. Um, yes. And with this, I believe we are ready to start with some models, but this is going to be after the break. Let's go on. 
let's start with our first model and see what's wrong with it or what's missing. This is a model which tries to explain how population dynamics work in a country, for instance, the population growth rate. And um, something like this, although with a little bit more, more elements, is in fact used when people try to predict or to explain where a country is going, given its current uh, birth, uh, given its yeah birth rate and, and death rate. So what we have here is the following. We have what we're interested in, the variable of interest, that is the population. We have a birth rate and we have a death rate. Now you can complicate things a little bit more and you can say, well, the death rate obviously depends somehow on the average lifetime. You can also say death rate depends on many other things. Uh, epidemics and uh, wars. Come again? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wars and stuff like that. Um, we don't care about this because the model is going to become too complicated. We'll see that later, but it's going to become too complicated uh, in th th for us to understand how varying this affects everything else because as, as you said everything else that needs to be held constant would now be much much bigger if we include all these other things and it's hard to 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 hold many things constant at the same time but there's still merit uh, merit to this model all right so how it works death rate obviously if we increase the death rate the population decreases in, uh, uh, on the other hand, if we increase the population for some reason, endogenous maybe, or let's say exogenous, the population, if we increase the population, the death rate increases as well, provided it's constant, obviously. Now you may argue, well, what if we increase the population by better health care? Then the death rate would also decrease. That's true, but this is not the point here. So the population increases the death rate, everything else held constant. So there is a balancing feedback or negative feedback loop in this diagram. It's taken from a book actually, uh, this Sturman book. It's a very nice book. It gives a lot of real life examples and their corresponding models, how people have been trying to model these situations. So it, it's a thick book. Um, it's available. Well, I shouldn't say that. You should buy it, yes. Um, so, yeah, Th there is the balancing feedback. On the other hand, we have birth rate as well, and the birth rate depends on the fractional birth rate. Um, this, so the real birth rate that you're thinking about, like percentage, so 2% more people every year, it's this one, and the birth rate in that model is just the real, the sheer number of people which were born, the number. So 2% out of 10,000 would be, what is it, 200? Uh, no, one, well, something. So birth rate. If we increase the birth rate, obviously we increase the population. If we increase the population, we increase the birth rate. There is the positive feedback, or the reinforcing in this diagram, reinforcing feedback. And you see there, there is a balance between this, these two feedbacks. Not only there is a balance, but every positive feedback here is associated with a negative feedback what we talked before. So, depending on the strength of these feedbacks, um, is it, no, it's not given here. Depending on the strength of these feedbacks, the population either explodes, so if, the, if this feedback is stronger than this one, eventually the population will explode. If you grow by 2% every year forever, that's uh, equivalent to explosion, or this is why the system is unstable in that sense. It goes, it explodes. Or this brings balance here. If this feedback is stronger, the system would go into a stable, balanced state. It's unfortunate that this stable state means total death for everyone because this would be zero, right? If, if more people die than they're born. But it's nevertheless a stable state. What we want, however, is um, neither of those. 
We don't want complete explosion. We don't want complete death. We want some form of dynamic equilibrium, meaning we need to be constantly playing with these two feedback loops and adjust the result according to what we want. Maybe we want growth of the population like most European countries would like. So we somehow try to increase the positive feedback loop. In some other countries, they may like to slow things down a bit. They increase the negative feedback loop. So we constantly play with these things and we change the equilibrium. And that's why this is, this is what, what is meant by dynamic equilibrium. Uh, it's a stationary non-equilibrium. It's in technical in the technical sense, it's not an equilibrium because we constantly change it. And this is somehow illustrated by this one, by this graph. The positive feedback, this is the positive feedback would, would move you away from an equilibrium state. And and mind you, equilibrium state is not always stable. This is a very unstable equilibrium state because slow uh, slow small pushes to the left or to the right would completely move you away. That's the road of positive feedback. But if you imagine now, we take that ball and we put it right here, like that. There is the negative feedback which goes together with every positive feedback. And the negative feedback would move the system towards a uh, positive equilibrium state. But what is wrong with this model, except, of course, for all the things that we didn't include? Uh, which we could have, but we didn't, I meaning wars, epidemics, stuff like that. What is wh what is wrong with it? Wh wh what is missing conceptually? Yes. Come again. Migrants. What is missing? I didn't get it. Uh, oh, immigrants. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that goes into the direction of things we didn't include. But conceptually, what is missing is the goal of the negative feedback loop. Every negative feedback loop should have a goal. In that case, is what is the desired population that we want to achieve? that we want to have. Otherwise, how can you balance the two feedback loops if, if you don't know what you want to achieve? So the goal of the negative feedback loop is missing. And this is the example here. Uh, imagine we have now a different setting. We have product quality and we have quality improvement programs. Very simple Mickey Mouse model. If the product quality goes down, the Supposedly, we need to increase our quality improvement programs, or we need to increase their number or their duration or whatever. If we do that, prod product quality would go up. <coughs> if the product quality goes up, we decrease them. So there is this balancing or negative feedback loop here. But what is missing is the goal. What is the goal of, the negative of, of this feedback loop? Well, the goal is obviously the desired product quality. What quality do we desire? Now, this is the, a better model because the decision whether to be concerned or not, whether to push forward these quality improvement programs represented by this quality shortfall, now depends not just on the absolute change in your product quality, but it depends on the relative change of the product quality with respect to what you want, what your goals are. So in all the models that you do and that you will do, Always try to have the goal. What is the goal of the negative feedback loop? And then that's a much better model because you can really you can influence things in an educated manner. So you you change the strength of the feedback loop for a purpose. You don't just change it uh, randomly. Let's go with another example, now more complete example. We have the following we have the following uh, attributes or following elements in your system. Product, at, well, imagine we want to model some kind of product adoption or want to model, uh, yeah, product adoption is good. We have product attractiveness, we have quality, all the things that we think 
influence product attractiveness. Quality, price, delays in delivery, and functionality. You may think of more, it's perfectly valid. First, what do we do when we build a model? We identify our elements. Remember, going back to the structural perspective of systems dynamics, we need to identify what elements are in our system. So, what, and then we define the, we have the elements. We need to uh, identify the link polarities or the positive or negative or correlation, in other words. What is the correlation or the causality? In that case, it's causality, actually. So, what do you think happens? What should be the polarity between quality and product attractiveness? Meaning, these are the causes and this is the effect. So, we increase our product quality. What happens to the product attractiveness, in your opinion? Yes, it increases. So, there is a plus here. Price decreases. Delivery delay decreases. Functionality obviously increases. When you increase the price, your product quality, your product attractiveness decreases because decreases. So, there is a minus. Well, it's not valid for all products. Obviously, some products, uh, even though they're expensive, all it takes is a nice keynote speech. All right. So, um, yeah. Next thing, we've identified the, the link polarities. We need to identify, and that's the, the, the tricky part, we need to identify the feedback loops. And remember, every negative feedback loop has a positive feedback loop. So, let's start with the negative feedback loops. This is an example of what you can think of. We have the same old things. Product attractiveness depends on quality, price, delivery delays, and functionality. But now, we've expanded the model a little bit because product attractiveness is also related to demand. So, for instance, if product attractiveness increases for some reason, then obviously the demand for this product would increase. I mean, that, that makes sense. If the demand for that product increases, you would feel more production pressure to produce more of this. Right? Your production, uh, your manufacturing plants would feel more pressure to produce more. However, so there's a plus. When your production uh, pressure increases, um, you may not be able to satisfy all the demand in most cases. So, if, it, if you're not able to satisfy all the demand, the price would quickly go up because normally what happens, the demand is much more elastic than your capability to manufacture things. So, you have huge surge of people wanting this product right now, this week, but in general, you can't satisfy all of them. So, you would feel more pressure to produce more, but it generally it won't be enough so, you have kind of a scarcity for this product, temporal scarcity, which will drive the price up. If the price goes up, we, we know product attractiveness goes down. If that goes down, everything else goes down. So, there's a huge balancing feedback loop here. This big one, B1, or negative feedback loop. But there's another one. As product pressure is increased, you may sacrifice some quality checks. Some quality programs may get swept under the carpet. So, your quality is likely to go down, which in if your quality goes down, your product attractiveness goes down as well. And there it goes again, negative feedback loop, B2. And so on and so forth. I mean, th it's pretty self-explanatory. If you, if you have production pressure to produce more of this, you will obviously be limited in the amount of other things that you can do in terms of innovation, in terms of launching new products and so on. So, if that decreases, um, <coughs> uh, the functionality of, uh, of your product would also decrease. You would not be able to incorporate innovations in your product because you say, yeah. I couldn't hear you, sorry.
good point, good point. So the question is, do all these um, influences or links weigh the same? Um, that doesn't have to be the case, and you can change that, but not in, in this diagram. There is no way that in, in these diagrams you can you can you can uh, you can have this in your model when w when you build the model in with the software that I'm going to show you in a second. You can do this, of course, because this is think of it as the front end. You still have to specify in the back end what exactly this relationship is. Is it linear? Is it nonlinear? And then that's where you specify the weights. But in yes. For instance, how can you be How can you be sure about anything? The quantitative aspect to the modeling is, um, I'll get back to this when we go to the modeling slide. The quantitative aspect to modeling is slightly different from what you think. That is true, but let me get back to this when the slide comes. All right. Um, so yeah, there is this other feedback loop, and of course there is, I mean, this is taken straight from the book, and I believe, yes, you, in your notes you have all the feedback loops explained. So all this, this is all fine, the system is stable, but then you start thinking, well, what are the positive feedback loops? And this is just an example of what the positive feedback loops may be or the reinforcing. Produ product attractiveness increases, demand for that product increases as well. Um, your economies of scale also increase, right? When you produce more, um, you would have better economies of scale, of course, up to some point, but in general, you will have. Your economies of scale increase you would be able to learn more about your product as you produce more of it. The quality increases, product attra attractiveness increases correspondingly, <coughs> and so on. There is this process improvement positive feedback loop. It's important to realize that these two feed this one and this one, they are kind of transposed on each other. They exist at the same time. It's not like first you go like this, this would explode and then you go with the negative feedback. No, they exist at the same time. They constantly balance each other out, all the feedback loops. Uh, what is this? Okay, so in general, yeah, but let me, let me first explain one more, uh, the big one, let's say this one. So your economies of scale increase due to higher demand. Uh, and obviously your delivery delay goes down because you have a lot more products that you can deliver now, provided of course, Everything else is held constant, meaning uh, your supply chain works the way it worked before. Your delivery delay goes down, product attractiveness, um, uh, product attractiveness goes uh, goes up since uh, you can deliver so fast. And then there is a positive feedback loop, reinforcing feedback loop here as well. So what you may have noticed is that positive feedback loops. Uh, they always have an even number of minuses, right? So to in a sense, in a very uh, intuitive way, two minuses cancel out, cancel out to produce a plus. They don't cancel out, but you multiply them, they, cause a, uh, they, they make a plus, so everything else is a plus. So if you have a loop with only an odd number of minuses, that's a negative feedback loop. Otherwise, it's a positive feedback loop. Yes. Which number? 
Uh, oh. Which number? Which loop? This one. But that that's all the come again? Where? Which loop? Tell me the number. You mean this one? No, but this is not a loop. I mean, this is a loop. I mean, see how c this is. I mean, a loop is really a loop. Like all the things are connected. I mean, the okay. So now the slide. What is modeling? And that's an important slide. I would like to spend a f few minutes on this slide, probably more than, than I should, but I really want to explain this slide well. There are two types of models. One is the so-called lifelike model, or let's say realistic model, where we, you really want to quantify the exact behavior of your system. And that's the quantification that you have in mind. You really want to predict what the temperature is going to be tomorrow. Okay, you really want to predict, for instance, at what temperature, what critical temperature superconductivity occurs in, in a material. Uh, you have to incorporate as many details as possible in these models. All right, so think of a flight simulator. You, I mean, flight simulators really need to be realistic to the last kind of drag force, okay? So, uh, or think of weather forecast. You don't want to know, well, the cloud density affects the weather by increasing the temperature, for instance. No, you want to know the temperature, is it going to rain? And certain times of the year, it's easy to predict the rain, but in general, you want a very precise a uh, very precise model. So um, what you do, you put this in a computer. That's why weather forecast people, they need supercomputers for their models. Think of games, computer games. Who plays computer games? Nice. <laughs> very nice. But so you know, um, your computer games, all of the developers, they always try to produce the most realistic models of humans' facial expressions, water flowing in a river. It has to be 100% correct to convince you that this is real. But in the same case of flights, in the same sense, flight simulator is the same thing. So real life models, we want exact behavior to predict exact behavior uh, in a quantitative way. Um, so the result is, yes, the model is correct, it predicts properly the temperature. Or no, this flight simulator is not correct. Uh, pilots always crash afterwards, something like this. It is, yes, I'll get back to this, but it is good to learn, yeah, it is good to learn, uh, the flight simulator is good to learn how to fly. You know exactly if, if you steer a little bit to the left what happens. You, you have the exact same um, forces acting in your flight simulator as they would act in your plane when you're in a plane. But it is difficult to learn how a plane works when you're in a flight simulator, meaning you know when you press a button what is the result. You know exactly uh, what the result is, but you don't know why really. Um, I'll get back to this. The second, the second type of models that we're going to be using in this course and that basically we're going to be using all the time also in next semester in, in this other course, are the so-called KISS models. Keep it uh, stupid and simple, or simple and stupid, what was it? Simple and stupid. Those of you in software, those of you in software engineering, you may have heard this KISS principle. The KISS models are completely different from the previous type. They're minimalistic models. We only, we're only interested in what causes a given behavior. What are the necessary, the bare bones of parameters needed to reproduce a given behavior? 
And I would like actually to give you an example here because I think it's an example always drives the point much better. Um, let, let's think about we observe a social system and we see that people cooperate. And you want to understand why do people cooperate? And it's actually the topic of my PhD thesis. So it's an easy example for me to, to come up with. So why do people cooperate? Do people really cooperate? Come again? Do people really cooperate? Yes. That's an empirical fact. <laughs> Unfortunately. Otherwise it would be very easy. Um, but let me, let me continue. So why do people cooperate? Then you say, okay, people have emotions, they have feelings, they have neighbors, they have friends, uh, they, they have work, they have some cultural uh, dependency. You try to put all this into a model, into the model of, of your people, of the average person. You let the f your society grow and you get cooperation. Did you really understand why people cooperate? No, you have thousands of factors which may have been the cause. You still don't know why people cooperate. So what you do, you start with a very minimalistic approach. You say, okay, people are selfish. Let's assume that people are selfish. That's the only cognitive ability that the people in my model have. They're selfish. You let your model run and you see that selfish behavior does not produce any cooperation, which makes sense. Therefore, you compare this with the empirical facts, meaning people do cooperate, your model produces different results, nobody cooperates, so it's wrong. It needs something more. Co uh, selfishness is either wrong or is not enough. So you go to a psychologist and you ask a psychologist, well, what could be this extra ingredient? And a psychologist tells you, well, it's an empirical fact that people care about fairness. It, there have been a lot of studies, and people do care about fairness. So you say, okay, my people are selfish, but in addition, they care about fairness. And depending on how strong these two feelings are, you get cooperation. And then you can, then you can say, okay, probably people's sense of fairness promotes and causes cooperation. But now imagine I didn't go to talk to a psychologist. Imagine I went to talk to an economist. And ec an economist tells me, oh well, principle number one or two, I don't know, is, in economics, is people respond to incentives. All right? So I decide to punish the people who don't cooperate in my model. So people are selfish, but in addition, they're punished if they don't cooperate. And then again, I get cooperation. Of course, they would cooperate if they're punished. Then I will say, well, punishment causes cooperation. Now imagine what kind of society I would build if I just stopped there. So, you see, there is, both of them are probably true. Also, punishment and the sense of fairness are probably true uh, at the same time. But the point of these models are that we're interested in the in the key parameters, the bare bone of, of factors that are required to produce a given behavior. And we can only do this if we start from the bottom and we start slowly adding things to the model, slowly adding meat to the model, unless we get the behavior. Otherwise, there is no way to tell which factor was the important one. And that is what is meant here by good to learn what is important to get a certain phenomenon. All right. Uh, yes, and we can only get a given ins uh, we can only get an insight into the problem. For instance, the two different cases that I described to you, sense of fairness and punishment, they're probably both true, and they are. Uh, just as these two uh, pic pictures are correct, right? This is kind of an X-ray, and this is some kind of what is it? Ultrasound. Uh, in fact, I don't know what this is. Um, probably some of you know. Maybe there is a baby inside. Is it? <laughs> I've never seen one. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Where, where is the baby, actually? <laughs> this one? <laughs> this, is, this is a head? <laughs> 
How can you say that this is a head? Uh, this one? Wow. Okay. So, but the point, <laughs> the point was, this is correct and this is correct, but it gives you a different perspective, right? This shows you the bones. This obviously doesn't show you bones. This doesn't show you soft tissue. This shows you soft tissue, right? So, my model with, with punishing people gives me an insight. The other model with sense of fairness also gives me an insight. They're probably both wrong, as, as it says here. I mean, uh, all models are kind of wrong because you only get a different perspective on a, on a very complex beast, if you imagine. You only get a different like spotlight from the perspective that you're interested in. And what perspective you're interested in actually depends on your customer, what they're interested in. Uh, or if you're into research, it means what you as a person are interested in. Are you interested in coming up with policies for punishing people more effectively so that they cooperate more? Or are you interested in coming up with policies uh, which reward uh, those who, uh, who cooperate? So um, addressing their sense of fairness. So these are the models. This is the modeling approach that we take. And in that sense, we're not trying um, le let's stay here. We're not trying to come up with the value, the quantitative value for selfishness that destroys cooperation, for instance. It, it would mean nothing. It would be just a parameter alpha, for instance. And it, the value may be 2.5. What does it mean? Nothing. It means nothing. But the insight that we got is, is what we're interested in. Does this somehow address your quantitative question from before. Yes, but actually what I'm curious about is that when you try to fit a, mo a model of, of some uh, data that you somehow know, for example, that you basically, you basically calculate your model that, that people are selfish and that they want to cooperate, but you build the model because you want to start to study something new, something you don't know how it's going to respond. So when you combine all those different parameters, What, what do you mean you want to study something new that you don't know? How can you study something if you don't know it exists? Let's, let's go back to the, the airplane. Yes. Uh, would you base uh, the, the model of new airplane on some uh, characteristics of a previous model? How, how can you assume that it's going to be... Oh, I think you're going into the direction of this type of models. If you want to have a model for an airplane, it has to be correct. It has to be very accurate. Even in a quantitative sense. Weight and, and all this kind of Let's say you have to try to measure how the market is going to accept a new product. Mm -hmm. So it's based from the, the characteristics of the people, right? The customers. How, 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 how can you do it? I, I cannot understand. What you can do, you can do two things. If you want to, if you want to answer the question, how many pieces of of this thing should I produce to maximize my profits? This, of course, would depend on what your customers want, and on your estimation of what your customers want. But if you want to answer this precise question, is it one million? Is it two million? Then you need these type of models. If you want to answer the question, what is it? that makes my customers buy this thing? Is it the shape? Is it, um, is it the weight? What is it? Then you're not interested in what the perfect weight is. Is it 5 grams or 10 grams? You only need to know that it's the weight. So this is the insight that you got. You see? All right. Let's 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 try to talk about this after the lecture. All right. Good. So it's important to to under, to make this difference here, because then your expectations would change. You shouldn't expect that the parameters that you get 
uh, mean anything in real life. For instance, uh, product attractiveness of 2.3. You get the product attractiveness of 2.3. What does it mean? It means nothing, obviously. But what is important is are the insights you got from what influences product, product attractiveness and are there any critical points where product attractiveness simply jumps and changes completely or qualitative changes, critical behaviors in, uh, in product, product attractiveness. It will become clearer when after you do the self-study. But I hope it's, it's not as vague as, as probably it was in the beginning. Let's repeat what we know so far. Uh, I repeat this because, again, there were some comments. Why don't we have sample solutions? Why don't we have um, exercises? And probably there would be comments. Why don't we have exercises for the exam? Why don't we have sample solutions for the models? The answer is there is no sample solution existing. It, it's impossible to say this is the right model, as you saw before. Wh what is it? Is it this one or this one? It depends on your perspective. That's why there are no sample solutions. As far as for exercise for the exam goes, we don't need those. Everything is in the slides. It's not like you have to calculate uh, balance sheets or stuff like that. And that's why the importance of you, or of people as problem solvers, is important. And that's why we needed project management, we needed problem solving cycle. Because it's not just a question of engineering to crank up a few equations and put it in a computer. You really need to know what you're solving, why you're solving it, what your goals are. Otherwise everything else doesn't make sense, doesn't connect <coughs> to the larger uh, perspective. And this is what the engineer of the future should be able to do, as was mentioned in the, in the, first, in the first lecture. So an engineer of the future should not only know differential equations and modeling, but also why we need these models, what problems we're solving, and what problems we cannot solve. Um, <coughs> yes, as, as we talked about, models allow for quantitative verification or prediction. If you want this, if you want to know this is the temperature tomorrow, uh, you have this kind of models, but if you want to just highlight mechanisms that are important to reproduce certain behavior, then you do something else. You, you go with minimalistic models. Yes, so this is what we're interested in. What is the mechanisms? And if you start playing just a little bit with the models, with just come up with the, with the situation that you want to model, and think of what may influence it, and then talk to a few friends of yours. Probably all of you would come up with different things. The point is you can reproduce any result you want. I mean, it's a fact. You can take a model, you can, you can put there thousands of, of factors that influence human behavior, for instance. You can reproduce anything. But do you really understand what caused the behavior? No, because there are thousands of, th of, these, of these factors. So that's what we want to understand. Um, how do we, we have complex systems, right? So we have a, the systems we want to study are complex. How do we model them? First, we start from the bare bones, the simplest thing possible, the way I explained with cooperation. You start with just one thing, very simple. You see, does this thing produce the behavior I want? No, then we need something more. What is it? Well, I don't know, it depends on your perspective. You add more and more until you get the behavior. So this is the principle of successive refinement. You start with a coarse grained picture and you constantly refine. And then keep in mind, sometimes systems, certain systems just cannot do what you want them to do. They're not, I mean, this is what, what is meant by respect feasibility. They just cannot do what you want them to do and you have to accept this. the self-dynamics of the system. So if you have a system running by itself without any influence from the outside, how does it work? Oh God, I need to speed up. Uh, all right, so this, this is not so important. Um, 
<laughs> no, I've already, I've already talked about this. We need to identify the system elements. Um, the challenge, of course, is initial conditions. How do we jumpstart the system? That's a challenge, but we're going to see that. Yeah, that, that's definitely not, not uh, so important. We're going to use Vensim. In your self-study, the self-study for today, there are inst instructions how to install Vensim. So this is how Vensim looks like. These are alternatives to Vensim. You can read them if you want. Alternatives to Vensim, doesn't matter. Introduction and so on. Yeah, I mean, these are not so... This is very confusing. This means delete. It's not the Pac-Man, so it's not something good. It's, it, you know, I mean, I got really confused. Uh, I, would, I would delete my system elements all the time, but it's, it's, it's not the Pac-Man. Let's go to your model in the self-study. It's the rabbit fox population. It's a very prototypical example of a population dynamics model. Uh, yes, let me ask this one. Uh, yeah. We have the two populations. One feeds on the second one. And the second one somehow is constantly regrown. And you can think of humans feeding on natural resources. Right? And the implicit assumption of most people is that natural resources are limitless. All right, so, yeah, we have either the, the consumer as predators and the raw materials, let's say oil, as uh, the rabbits or the prey. Let's look at these two populations separately, prey and, and uh, uh, predator. This is the rabbit, this is the prey. There is the rabbit population here. There is a birth rate for the rabbit, the number of births, the absolute number of births, and the absolute number of deaths. Okay? And of course, the deaths and the births depend on the birth rate and, and the average lifetime. That's fine. You can put this... Oh, I'm sorry for this. The rate of change of the rabbit population, so this is X. The rate of change with time of the rabbit population is the difference between what is born and what dies at any given point of time. So if you solve this, R here, R is the difference between birth rate and death rate. So if R is positive, if you get more births than deaths, this thing explodes exponentially. If it's negative, so this is the positive feedback, right? If it's negative, we have a negative feedback, uh, which is zero. If it's not something important, Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right, so explosion, death. Let's look at the foxes. Uh, well, what is that? No, that's the rabbit populations, right? So you might say well, this is not realistic. This is a minimalistic model, but it's not realistic because rabbits don't explode. Uh, I mean, rabbit pop <laughs> <laughs> rabbit population doesn't explode. So you say we need something more in our model. We need carrying capacity. A given piece of land can only support so many rabbits. So you, you include the carrying capacity, which obviously re produces the effect of overcrowding. So when rabbits or people start to overcrowd, yeah, you know, I mean, this is quite negative. So this increases the death rate. So the more rabbits you have, the more overcrowded they would get and the more deaths you will have. So with this, you get a saturation. Okay? The rabbit population now saturates to the carrying capacity. Uh, okay, sorry. Of course, it's scaled by the, by the net uh, birth rate, R. M is the carrying capacity. So these are very simple differential equations. The rate of change in the rabbit population depends on the birth minus the carrying capacity. And you can already see that this would produce saturation because the square term would kick in and would limit the growth. As, as X grows. Fox, foxes. The difference between fox and rabbits are the foxes need rabbits to live. One minute. Rabbits are reproduced by some eternal machine or something. They always come up, but the foxes need rabbits. Here, the fox food availability. These are the rabbits. By the way, this is in Vensim. 
and um, this is the model you have to play with for your self-study. So in Vensim, if you click on any of these variables, you can see an explanation of what the variable does and what it means. Fox food availability, how many rabbits are there for, for, for the foxes to eat? You see, this is the typical, the average fox, representative fox. Again, fox deaths, fox births. We have an initial condition here. The average fox life, everything is the same as before with the difference of fox food availability. We get these dynamics. If you couple now the two populations together, which is the model you have to play with in your self-study, um, you get basically two couple differential equations. You can solve them either, uh, either via analytically or with Vensim. Right, so you see, this is the rabbits. The rabbits eventually um, lead to to more consumption by by the foxes, and this is the dynamics, the different dynamical regimes that you can get. These are the foxes, rabbits. You can get them oscillating more or less, at kind of regularly. This is these are also oscillations. For instance, have a look here the rabbit population reaches a maximum at time step 10. At time step 10, the fox population also reaches a maximum. There are so many rabbits, foxes eat them. Suddenly, the rabbits decline because they're all eaten by the foxes and the foxes decline. But now look, the rabbits, the rabbit population recovers much faster, much faster than the fox populations. So it takes some time for the foxes to find the rabbits and eat them. Right? So you have these different periods. You have, you see, these are different regimes. And in your self study, yes, that's the end. In your self study, you need to play with all these parameters here and reproduce these regimes and more. And the self study is about explaining how the different, how the different factors here influence the dynamics. Thank you.